Hi everyone, I'm Bobby, and I have one very big secret that I've decided to share with you. I think it's time to show my cards, and I wish I'd done it sooner. Well, you will understand everything now, but in the meantime, get ready to listen, watch, like the video, write comments, and do not forget to subscribe to this channel. I was born a normal child, quite healthy, I had no problems with development, and everything was fine. I am the second child in the family. In addition to me, there is an older brother and sister. Our parents work, but most of all, our father. Despite the workload, they always found time for us to spend the evening together. Basically, we're a close-knit family, but everyone still has their own secrets, right? When I was 11 years old, my friends and I decided to go to the ice rink, and I wanted to learn how to skate. I'm not a fan of such an active pastime, but it was boring to stay at home during the winter holidays. It was a great day. It was warm, the rink was almost empty, so we had as much fun as we could. My friend Michael taught me how to skate. I fell on my knees, then on my elbows, and it was terribly painful. But after a couple of hours, I was already doing much better. When I got home, my little sister Brittany asked me where I'd been, and I said, I went to the ice rink, and she started crying. It turns out that she also dreamed of riding there. I told her that as soon as possible, we would go there again. Now it's just warm and it's dangerous. Brittany cried, but there was nothing she could do. We went to our rooms and the topic was temporarily closed. A couple of days later, the weekend began. My parents suggested that the whole family go to my grandmother to visit her. Brittany said she was going to a friend's house for a sleepover, and mom let her go, and the rest of us went to see grandma. On the way, I remembered that I had promised to help Michael with his homework, and I had promised to help clear the snow from the yard, so I got out of the car. I quickly said hello to my grandma, then went home to change my clothes, and then the phone rang. It was Katie, Brittany's best friend. Isn't she with you? I asked, alarm in my voice. But she said they hadn't talked to each other in a couple of days. I hung up and ran to her room. On the floor, I saw the ice rink ticket I'd bought the day before. Fear gripped my mind. I ran out of the house and took a taxi to the ice rink. Already from afar, I saw Brett's pink hat. There were no people nearby, and the ice rink was closed because of the thin ice. I ran up to her and began to call her, and she just shouted, Look how I've already learned! And spun around. As I approached, the ice crunched under my feet. Oh no, I did not have time to approach when I heard another crunch. She froze. I managed to grab her arm, throw her to the side, and then fell through the ice. The cold water seeped into my eyes, mouth, and ears. I woke up in the hospital. My little sister was fine, but I was very ill. Britt got punished by my parents while I was being treated. After I was discharged, I began to have hearing problems, when I realized that I could hardly hear anything. When I was approached by doctors, my parents, I could make out half of it by reading their lips. The diagnosis was disappointing. The doctor said that I was losing my hearing. It took me a long time to come to terms with this idea. Life in restriction was scary. I didn't hide my feelings, and my family was also concerned. Most of all, my sister felt guilty. She believed that if she had not gone to the ice rink that day, nothing like this would have happened. At first, I was angry at her, at myself, and at everyone else. You must agree, no one wants to lose their hearing or vision or leg overnight. In general, it was terrible, and I was mired in depression. I thought my life was over for this one, but then there was some hope. It turned out that my hearing was not 100% gone, and there was a way out. A little later, I was prescribed a hearing device, but I was so embarrassed about it because I was now disabled. The device was not that ugly, but it is an extra reminder that I am not as okay as before. We decided not to tell anyone, so I grew my hair and wore it discreetly. Almost resigned to the idea that it would always be like this, I didn't even get upset anymore. Well, after a couple of months, Michael suggested that I go to a club and relax. I agreed, since it had been a long time since we rested like this. We arrived at the place, the mood seemed to rise, and I decreased the volume on the device because of the loud music and then went to the toilet. I didn't hear what the strangers were saying to me. They were drunk and pushed me. Before I could turn up the volume, a fist flew at my face. I fell to the ground and my machine shattered. I tried to lift myself off the floor, but a foot flew into my face and smashed my nose. 
I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't hear anything. My eyes were swimming. And then Michael came in, and he shoved everyone around, punched my assailant a few times, and took me out of the building. He was saying something to me, but I didn't hear him. I was really freaking out, and I screamed out of desperation. Michael was standing there with a surprised face, and I pulled out my hearing device and showed it to him. It took him a while to figure out what it was, and then he took a taxi and we got home. There my parents told Michael my whole story, and I sat sullen and didn't talk to anyone. I didn't want pity, so it was easier to pretend I was okay. I didn't even say goodbye to my friend. I just went to my room. The next day, Michael came back with a box in his hand. I opened it and saw a new hearing device. It was much more beautiful, thinner and more inconspicuous than my old one. I looked at my friend, who was standing there smiling. I immediately put it on and began to hear. Why, it's incredibly expensive, Mike. You're saving up for a wheelbarrow. I told him, and he said that now I owe him. His jokes always made me laugh. I was touched, hugged my friend, and thanked him. If you don't tell me something's going on again, I'll kill you myself, he said. At that moment, I realized how lucky I was to have such a friend. My family was grateful to Michael, and he said I was a fool. And what an idiot he was. He remained so despite the rumor. I knew he was joking so as not to feel sorry for me, because I can't stand pity. Since then, I have worn his device every day. But I realized that I needed to overcome myself, accept myself. A few months later, Michael and I decided to go for a walk during Halloween. We dressed up as monsters and went to scare the kids and give out candy. There, at the festival, we met two girls and somehow imperceptibly broke up in pairs. We spent the whole evening with the four of us and it was all fun until Michael's friend suggested that we go to visit her by the pool. We went there and decided to have a party on the spot. A heated pool is a topic, but before getting into the water, I had to remove the device so as not to take any risks. Michael saw my confusion, but he asked me to trust him. I took off the machine and went swimming. I could see my friend Kelly talking to me, but I couldn't hear anything. At that moment, Michael came up to her and said something. Then she immediately got out of the water and sat on the edge of the pool. I swam out of the water and sat down next to her, put on the device, and she asked, How did it happen? I told her my story, and she patted me on the shoulder. It seemed to me that she was disappointed. I know it's a defect that can never be fixed. In my head, I thought, what is she talking about? I got up and was about to leave when Kelly suddenly jumped off and came over to me and showed me her ear. I was born this way. I wear it almost without taking it off, she said, straightening her hair again. At that moment, I was strangely happy or something, smiled and Kelly smiled back at me. Michael pretended not to see anything and brought us food and drinks. Kelly and I have been inseparable ever since. She showed me that it is not necessary to dwell on the problem and our diagnosis. She believes that her life is not over and that so much is still ahead. Our acquaintance inspired me to live a little, and I realized that despite our defects, we are still people, the same as everyone else. And that shouldn't stop you from living your life to the fullest, ever. What do you guys think? Have you ever encountered something like this, and are there any of your friends who have health problems like ours? Hello everyone, my name is Steven, and I want to tell you a ridiculous story. I have a best friend named David. We like to play tricks on each other. Sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's weak, and sometimes we even cross all the borders of humor. It is also not uncommon for us to perform various types of challenges. By the way, we take all this seriously, and you must do the task no matter how, and I will tell you how because of one task. I almost got kicked out of school, and I even spent one night in prison, and now everything is in order. It was David's turn to come up with a task for me. Everything was as usual. While I was waiting, I was already planning my task for him. Well, we met him early in the morning at 10 o'clock on the basketball court in the schoolyard. He was in a happy mood and had a sly look in his eyes. In general, the task was that I just didn't talk for 24 hours. That is, I won't be able to utter a single word or even the slightest sound until the next morning. It seems that this day I was not supposed to have any serious event or conversation. 
This task seemed to me quite harmless, and I could have easily completed it. And now the countdown has started. At first, everything was easy and simple, but even I didn't have to work too hard. I walked by myself and I was silent, but soon I became bored, and I could not communicate with anyone. I wanted to share my news, and that's when I played football, the ball accidentally hit the car of the director. Honestly, I didn't kick it. We were all called to the office. He was furious. It was terrifying. The director asked everyone who did it. No one confessed, and everyone started making excuses. At one point, he noticed that I was just silent and looked at me suspiciously. I guess I looked more like the responsible one than anyone else. Then he said that I was being suspended from school for a week as a punishment and would have to call my parents to school tomorrow. It was a shame because it wasn't my fault, but I couldn't explain myself. I just had to agree and leave. David's assignment was beginning to strain me. I thought that this would be the end of all the trouble, but this was not the case. Walking home after school, I saw a woman in front of me drop her purse. I ran up and picked it up and was about to take it to the woman when a policeman grabbed my arm. He probably thought I stole it. He started asking where I got this wallet from, but it was so evil I couldn't explain the situation. That made this guy think I was the thief. He pulled me into the car and drove me to the police station. Why did all this nonsense happen on this particular day, as if it was all on purpose? In addition, at that police station, the investigator asked me for a long time where I stole the wallet and what else did I steal. I didn't feel like everyone was blaming me. I just wanted to help. This silence was already weighing on me. Without receiving an answer from me, the investigator put me behind bars for a day until the circumstances were clarified. With me in the room sat two more men. One of them was bald and had tattoos, and the other was dressed in biker clothes. They may have been jailed for hooliganism. They asked me why I was locked up in prison, but I couldn't answer them. This made them look at me angrily, thinking I was ignoring them. They repeated their question again, but in a rougher tone. But there was no response from me. At that moment, they were already moving toward me, their fists clenched. Out of fear, I started to wave them away and jumped into the corner. Then one of them said that I might be dumb, and they calmed down and sat down. I couldn't sleep that night. The atmosphere in the prison was very oppressive, and this silence created discomfort. And the next morning, I couldn't wait for the 24 hours to end. I counted every minute. As soon as it was 10 o'clock, I screamed. That woke up the two men in the cell. They couldn't understand what was happening. A police officer immediately approached. I started to explain that it wasn't me who stole the wallet and why I didn't say anything all this time. Everyone around me started laughing and said it was a stupid thing to do. Fortunately, I was immediately released, advised not to play such games anymore. I was glad to speak again and even seemed to feel more cheerful. As it turned out, this seemingly harmless task is not actually easy. As I walked home, I began to think about my tougher assignment for Dave. Such a stupid situation happened to me. Subscribe and see other interesting stories.